Well, greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Horus Heresy Lord Breakdowns. We are now on book two, and we'll be continuing to take out the little tidbits of interesting lore from the various books, and at least partially summarizing the event, so spoilers, obviously enough. After the somewhat disastrous negotiations with the Interrex, it would be fair to say that little old Horus was a bit miffed. His ego had taken a rather serious pounding, since rather than convincing this long-lost strand of humanity to rejoin their human cousins, and one would assume also to see their error of their ways when it comes to coverting with the aliens, but instead the Interrex were now an undeniably hostile force and would probably have to be eradicated completely. Not, um, quite to plan, then. Now, presumably due to this little bump to his ego, the Warmaster decided to take the Emperor up on a previous offer. At the Triumph of Ulanor, where he was named Warmaster, the Emperor suggested that his legion be renamed the Sons of Horus. At the time, Horus had refused the honour. But now he apparently saw the merit of the name change, and so the Lunar Wolves became the Sons of Horus. And with the name change, of course, came a new coat of paint. The pristine white of the wolves replaced by the shallow sea green of the Sons of Horus. Shortly after the celebration, though, the Warmaster took another bap to his ego. A world previously conquered by the Lunar Wolves had apparently revolted. Erebus of the Word Bearers had requested the 63rd Expedition's aid on the planet of Davin, a planet made compliant by the Lunar Wolves a long time ago. At that point, Davin had been populated by hardy but primitive tribes of human origin. This particular apple, however, had fallen quite some distance from the tree of human civilization, and had evolved, or perhaps devolved, in a way that made them quite separate from wider humanity. Normally, they would probably have been slated for extermination, having deviated too far from proper humans. However, the Lunar Wolves would have it done differently. The various tribes had fought the Astartes with great courage and honour, and what made this considerably more remarkable was the fact that the Davenites barely aspired to a Bronze Age level of civilization. The Davenites had a proud history of warfare, having fought each other over the plains of Davin for as long as anyone could remember. And so, even though well, they had no real way of actually hurting the Astartes, they still fought on until their sense of honour deemed it acceptable for them to surrender. And even better, after they surrendered, the Davenites showed every sign of fully embracing the Imperium of Man as a worthy conqueror, and seemed eager to integrate. And while at this point in the Great Crusade the Iterator Order had yet to be formed, the task of educating and civilizing newly compliant worlds usually fell to the legions who conquered them. Or, in this particular case, and the Lunar Wolves, their allies, the Word Bearers. Under the command of Corferon himself, the Word Bearers chaplain set about re educating the Davenites and preparing them for their new role in future events. And now, the newly minted Sons of Horus had been called back to this planet to quash an insurrection of some sort, though when the 63rd expedition arrived, there was no sign of any war on Davin. Even when the Warmaster made landfall alongside his Mournival and elements of the Legion, there was no hint of any ongoing conflict. It would appear that Erebus had some explaining to do. And speaking of the nefarious word-bearer, Erebus's stock had risen quite sharply since we last saw him, or fallen rather sharply, depending on who you ask. He had been spending a lot of time with Horus. In fact, the Primarch had practically isolated himself both from his ship's command structure and the Mournival as they were headed towards Davin, locking himself in with Erebus, talking about uh, God Emperor only knows what, but it's probably not particularly good. 
the Mournival on their side was getting a little bit annoyed that their Primarch had become so withdrawn of late and that he seemed to favour the company of Erebus rather than his more traditional advisors amongst the Mournival and of course the strategic officers. And this is what I mean with his stock falling in some places. Clearly Horus had begun to value him to an uncomfortable degree, whilst the rest of the Mournival apparently was not quite as fond of him. Indeed, Loken had started to get some suspicions about the man, feeling that he wasn't quite right, although I hasten to point out that at this point, nobody knew anything about the fact that he had apparently stolen the anathema from the Interrex. Now, back to the whole Primarch thing. So, Horus had become sullen and withdrawn after the disaster with the Interrex, and this gives us a little bit more interesting insight into Primarchs, which are exceedingly fascinating creatures. They look like humans, and occasionally they even act like humans, but their psychological responses are clearly quite different, or perhaps not so much different as much as they are multiplied. In some cases, this manifests in a murderous rage, or brooding silence, almost oppressive silence. The books are filled with examples of Primarchs turning in a moment from good humour and outright glee and camaraderie to this dark, brooding persona that outright scares their closest advisors. Now granted, this might not necessarily be a reflection of their psychological state of mind at the time being. The simple fact that a Primarch is way bigger than pretty much anyone, including Astartes, and has an absolutely ludicrous potential for violence would probably make them a little bit scary even at the best of times, but even then they seem to exude almost a oppressive force, as I said. And in some cases, these character traits, anger, rage, pride, etc., even came to define the Primarchs themselves. In the case of Horus, it took the form of what I can only really describe as hubris, perhaps. Or maybe that's a little bit too strong of a word. Imagine this. Imagine that you can do anything, literally anything at all, and throughout your life you have done quite literally that. You have commanded vast armadas of spaceships, millions of troops, hundreds of thousands of the Emperor's finest space marines. You have conquered entire star systems. And while doing all of this, you have received absolute ridiculous amounts of praise and head pats. And after an extended period of being told you are literally the best thing ever, well, you might just start to believe it. In Horus's case, he not only believed it, he based his very existence upon it, his very being. And so far, he had been validated in doing so. After all, he was the Emperor's chosen, he was the War Master. And yet, despite all of that, he had failed with the Interrex, at least in his own mind. And this must, to a certain degree, as ridiculous as it sounds, have come as a bit of a shock to Horus. Again, he had been chosen by the Emperor, the most perfect being he knew of. Surely the Emperor couldn't have chosen wrong, could he? Surely Horus could not possibly be unworthy of the honour, surely that would be pure nonsense. After all, Horus simply could not fail. He was the Emperor's proxy. Just the very thought alone would be unthinkable. And when that simple truth, that you might fail, threatens to undermine your very sense of self, well, it would be no surprise if you began looking for excuses. And this, to a large degree, I think, explains why he had been locking himself away with Erebus. Because whilst the Mournival was offering honest counsel, and quite possibly even criticism, seeing as several of them had been heavily against the idea of engaging in open diplomatic relations with the Interrex, Erebus, on the other hand, offered soothing words to balm a bruised ego. Perhaps Erebus even had uh, something to say about the Legion's new name. As I mentioned, Horus had initially refused the honour of renaming his Legion the Sons of Horus, but as the timeline is not entirely clear, it's not immediately obvious whether or not Horus did this immediately after the failure of the Interrex, 
or after a period of time of locking himself in a room with Erebus. So it's unclear just how much of the honor for that particular name change that Erebus can be given, although I wouldn't be particularly surprised if this would be something Erebus would be bringing up. After all, it would provide him with a essentially risk-free way of buttering up the War Master just a little bit extra. And this would most definitively be the time to do it, as Erebus had to go ahead of the Expeditionary Fleet and leave the fleet to go to Davin before the War Master and the rest of the fleet. This news, of course, was met with a certain sense of relief amongst many members of the Mournival, who had been less than entirely welcoming of the fact that an outsider was hogging so much of their dear War Master's time. And now that the Expeditionary Fleet had arrived on Davin and found absolutely no sign of war, well, things were starting to get a little bit confusing. Erebus quickly showed himself meeting the landing forces of the expedition, along with a small force of word bearers that had apparently been on the planet for a bit before this. He led the War Master and the elements of the landing forces to a small native village, essentially just a small gathering of yurts out on the steppes. And this is where we get reintroduced to a character we first saw in the first book, Ignis Carcassi. I have no idea if that is the proper pronunciation, but we'll go with that for now. A man like Ignis, a mere remembrancer, would normally not be allowed into gatherings of military personnel, like the one we were about to see here, with the War Master himself in attendance. However, Ignis had been brought along by Garviel Loken. Loken, as with many members of the Mournival, had started to question Erebus's intentions, and he wanted a pair of fresh eyes to observe Erebus, and see if perhaps somebody as relatively sharp as Ignaz Carcassi could maybe pick up on something that Loken had overlooked. There is also a second part to this, namely that Loken did not want to even think the thought that one of his brother Astartes might somehow be playing them false. After all, in these pre-Horus heresy days, the thought of a brother turning upon a brother in any way seemed utterly ludicrous to the vast majority of the legions. In fact, I should perhaps go one step further. It seemed like heresy. It seemed like a thing that simply could not happen. It's not that they were just simply convinced that it was unlikely. They considered it to be a virtual impossibility. They considered the act of a brother turning upon brother to be something like gravity suddenly turning off. It simply couldn't happen. It would go against the very laws of the universe. And I stress this point to make you understand that it really did seem like an impossibility for Loken to think that Erebus might be working against him. This wasn't just naivete, he literally considered this to be against the laws of nature. And so he brought with him a disgraced poet to uh, help him see things straight. Interesting choice, but hey, at least Ignasi managed to pay for his ticket down to the surface almost immediately. During the meet-and-greet ceremony where Erebus and his word-bearers conducted the Sons of Horus and, of course, the Primarch to their new meeting spot, Ignas noted a rather strange little happenstance that went on between Abaddon and Erebus. He noticed that the two appeared to exchange what looked like a small silver object being passed between the two as they shook hands. Of course, the Remembrancer had no idea what this signified, or if it did anything, but it was likely a lodge medal. Our first indication so far that the various warrior lodges are intertwined and mutually recognizable. And as will be made rather obvious later on, this was for a rather insidious purpose. However, now we get to the meeting proper. Erebus made the claim that Davin was indeed not compliant after all. And he did so in a most undiplomatic manner. Horus may appear to encourage levity during his briefing sessions, because, after all, it plays well with the mortals, but he really, really hates being interrupted. And Erebus was throwing in one hell of a doozy with this one. He was treading dangerously close to a grade A beating by delivering the news in the way he did, literally interjecting it directly into Horus's own speech, something the Primarch was not particularly fond of. 
The chaplain explained that the garrison left behind to control and rule over Davin under the command of Eugene Temba had rebelled. An act virtually unheard of at the time, and even now, the vile traitor Temba sat on Davin's moon in open defiance and mockery of Horus and the Emperor. Now, this was an insult Horus could not possibly overlook. He had personally gifted Temba the governorship. He had made the planet compliant. Now it was one of his worlds, one of his commanders, that openly declared itself in opposition to the Imperium. Oh no siree. Horus was furious and immediately ordered the spearhead returned to the vengeful spirit and redeployed to crush Temba's uprising. Erebus pleaded oh so sweetly with the War Master to send someone else in his stead. Surely they could not risk someone as important as the mighty War Master in such a relatively minor errand. Not to mention, this was probably a trap, a rather obvious one as well. Surely there would be many others willing to go in the War Master's stead and act as his proxy to deal with this rebellion on his world, the rebellion of the War Master's commander. <laughs> oh yes, tempers ran rather high after that. And indeed, the only one who stayed calm was little Ignasi Carcassi, who later told Logan how he suspected the Wordbearer of having some ulterior motive. After all, surely the Wordbearer must have known that the news would enrage the Primarch and leave him with no choice but to go after Temba personally. And yet, he had chosen to deliver the news in a highly inflammatory manner, and even suggested that the War Master send someone in his stead, as if he was too afraid to go meet the traitor himself, and all of this in front of the gathered officers of the expedition no less. It was quite clearly suspicious, but any further introspection was interrupted by the first captain. Abaddon was, generally speaking, not particularly fond of mortals, and even less fond of remembrances, and disapproved quite strongly of Loken's mingling. Ignaz chose this moment, as the brain-dead moron he was, to ask the first captain about the flash of silver he had seen pass between him and Erebus. A truly mind-numbingly bad choice of location and timing. In fact, the very act is vaguely reminiscent of trying to buttfuck a tiger without lube. And if it wasn't for Loken's quick reaction, it would have had much the same outcome. Unsurprisingly, the captain of the first company did not take particularly kindly to being questioned by a mortal, and almost bashed his tiny little brains in, but Loken got in the way and managed to talk him out of it, just barely. Now, granted, Abaddon had by all accounts never been the most stable of individuals, but this level of aggression towards the civilian, no less, seems, um, a tad bit odd, a bit, uh, overblown, perhaps. I mean, yes, many of the Astartes had expressed, um, distaste, shall we say, to the growing numbers of remembrances and the increasingly non-military nature of the Imperium's administration, but... There's quite a way from distaste to flat-out fucking murder, and it is my supposition that the Lodgers had been fostering an anti-mortal narrative for quite some time, blaming the normies for anything and everything, a theme we oft see repeated in the various books. Eventually, the Lodge had apparently successfully crafted the idea that the mortals were somehow looking down on the Astartes as brutish beasts. The mortals were bureaucrats, cowards, growing fat of the blood and sacrifice of the Astartes. A narrative all the more convincing for the kernel of truth hidden at its core. With the crusade closing to an end, the Imperium quite naturally turned towards civil administration to help rule the vast areas of space that had been conquered. By necessity, ruling and controlling a galactic empire requires procedures, documentation, bureaucracy, and the people trained to operate the Byzantine machine of the administratum. 
or the lodge did was take that suggestion one step further. The administratum was not merely relieving the army and the Astartes of the burden of ruling, but actively replacing them and seeking to push them further into the fringes and take away their just rewards for winning the galaxy. And as such, in time, they would surely get rid of them entirely. I am not entirely convinced this would be the case. There will always be wars to be fought, both internally and externally. Even when the Eldar had more or less complete control over the galaxy, they were still fighting off roaming bands of orcs, warbands, and other minor invasions and upstart races. Peace is... Uh, not a state in which any large empire is ever fully going to find itself in, so there will always be a need for warriors. But it did prove to be a powerful tool, this narrative, for influencing the Astartes and justifying the future betrayal. Back on the vengeful spirit, whilst in transit to Davin's moon, Loken chose to confront Erebus and speak to him about various subjects and of chaos. The as of yet relatively unknown thing known as chaos. Now, Loken had been given a basic lowdown by the Primarch after the uh, happenstances on the Whisperheads. He had also been told a bit more about chaos by the guard back with the Interrex moments before everything went to hell in a handbasket. Erebus assured Loken that there was no such thing as chaos. The warp was not home to any truly intelligent entities, and they certainly could not create any sorceries or magics. And after all, had the Interrex not shown how deceitful they were? They had unjustly accused the Warmaster's forces of stealing an anathema from the Hall of Devices. Clearly they could not be trusted. He told Loken precisely what he wanted to hear. Yet, even after the conversation, doubt still nagged at Loken's mind, especially as he remembered that no one knew what manner of weapon had actually been stolen. Oh, and by the way, the Warmaster had gotten himself his own pet remembrancer. A famous writer lady from Terra had been granted full access to him to chronicle his thoughts and write a great work about him for posterity. As previously mentioned, Horus had a bit of an ego, and certainly he would not want to pass up the chance to have a book or two written about him. At the moment, however, he was a bit uh, busy with planning the murder of the rebels on the moon. The spearhead had been recovered, and the vengeful spirit had made full speed towards the moon, even outpacing its supporting fleet elements. No worries though, at worst, Tempo would have a few regiments of Imperial Army, and maybe some local militia. There were thousands of Astartes on the vengeful spirit, along with the Dies Ira Imperator Titan, a more than sufficient force. In fact, it was a horribly disproportionate response considering the expected opposition, and so with all haste, the Sons of Horus began their assault on the moon. Encountering no opposition to their landings, no flak, no ground fire, and no fortifications of any kind. Just a strange Vox Transmission mission broadcasted from the planet below from an incredibly powerful source. The transmission were eerily similar to the ones encountered at the Whisperheads. And Loken was none too pleased with it at all. His misgivings were further strengthened when they landed in what was supposed to be a forested area. An area that now resembled nothing so much as a rotting swamp. The Astartes sank to their knees in greenish-brown goop, and the air smelled so bad even their helmets couldn't filter it all out. To make things even more eerie, there was absolutely no sign of life whatsoever. No insects, no birds, and certainly nothing that could live in the, uh, quote-unquote, water, if such a term is applicable, to the veritable ocean of rotted filth that covered the landing zone. And so, using his remarkable powers of deduction, Loken came to the surprising conclusion that something was fucking wrong, and ordered his troops to be extra cautious, a wise precaution, considering the planet also appeared to be covered in a thick blanket of vomit-coloured fog that limited the visibility of even the Astartes and their helmet sensors to only a handful of meters. <laughs> 
And the Sons of Horus were not the only ones trudging across the rather shitty terrain at the moment. Erebus and his word bearers had also tagged along, meaning that both forces were now on Davin's Moon looking out for this traitor that had so annoyed the War Master. And so the Sons of Horus almost said Lunar Wolves there, that's gonna take some getting used to. And the word bearers continued trudging through the swamps with no resistance. None. Zero, zip, nilch, nilch, nada. No gunfire, no artillery, no minefields, absolutely nothing. The rebels were not doing a particularly good job of defending this place, were they? The only sign that anything had ever lived here was the occasional rotted corpse of animal, or occasionally man, that the Sons of Horus kicked up as they moved through the bog. Curious that there would be so many corpses in the area. Almost as if it had rotted out instantly. Odd enough. And then, of course, the surprise happened. Uh, as the Sons of Horus and the Word of Bears found themselves under attack by those very same corpses rising out of the swamps. Now, originally, you might think that rotting corpses would not be much of a match for Astartes, but these things were uh, not normal. You might think that would be rather obvious, considering, you know, the whole corpses attacking part, but they're also stupendously strong, able to drag even Astartes down into the stinking muck, attempting to tear open their armor and drown them, or at the very least reduce their mobility for their nastier cousins. Out of the fog, some particularly horrifying creatures began approaching. They are described thusly in the book. Mouldering corpses and bloated, muttering abominations, each with a single milky distended eye and a scabra's horn sprouting from its forehead. That sounds a lot like plague bearers to me, Papa Nurgle's favoured foot soldiers. Now, from Horus's talk with Loken back on the Whisperheads, we do know that the Astartes and the Legions had run into demons previously. So in all your likelihood, this was not the first time the Legiones Astartes had run into, well, plague bearers or other forms of demonic enemies, but it probably would be very, very, very rare, and it would probably be in areas already very obviously heavily polluted by warp energies. The moon of Davin was supposed to be safe, it had been secured, indeed the planet below had been deemed fully compliant, with the moon with it. And so finding such a clear warp infestation would undoubtedly be rather shocking. The Astartes had absolutely no reason to expect that this would be here. They had been sent to deal with a bunch of rebels, after all, not demonic entities. And again, remember, the vast majorities of the Astartes didn't really understand what they were fighting at this point. Indeed, Loken himself describes them not as demons, but as some form of Xenos beasts. So even though Loken had a vague understanding of the warp manifesting in the real world, even then he couldn't look at these clearly unnatural creatures and make the leap of logic immediately that these were not Xenos, but indeed demons. And as demonic creatures, they had some capabilities the Astartes were not used to. The surprise attack proved to be rather effective. The Astartes did not know quite what they were fighting. They certainly did not know of the capabilities of the things they were fighting. For example, the fact that their apparently rusted and pitted blades could cut through Astartes plate like butter, for example. That undoubtedly came as a rather unfortunate discovery. And additionally, they had been caught entirely unaware. They had literally been walking across a writhing carpet of these monstrosities for minutes now, and they were completely and utterly surrounded and cut off from each other. The Sons of Horus and the Word Bearers had landed on the planet in four phalanxes, four organizations that were closing in on the main source of the signal that they'd picked up in orbit, assuming that to be some kind of command center, at the very least some area where the enemy might be gathering. Naturally, the Legiones Astartes phalanxes had spread out to make sure that they could approach the target from multiple directions. This meant that when the ambush actually came, it quickly spread the remaining Astartes out even more. 
as the Vox was not being entirely cooperative at the time and also filled with screaming and such things, and with absolutely nothing in the way of identifiable landmarks, it proved to be extremely difficult for the Asati's forces to rally and gather themselves in a single location, cause one location looked pretty much exactly like any other. This was when fate intervened. You remember Horace's pet remembrancer? A lady by the name of Petronella Vivar from a great house named the Carpinus. This was a famous remembrancer house filled with all kinds of wonderful artists. Petronella Vivar had received everything she could have ever wanted throughout her entire life. She was astronomically wealthy, in the kind of way that only a noble house in a galactic empire could possibly be. We are talking about people who owned land masses, not islands but continents, etc. And having been given everything she ever wanted throughout her entire life, she was understandably miffed when the Warmaster said that she could not come along with them to the moon of Davin, citing that it was unsafe. Vivar decided to ignore that order and followed the expeditionary forces down in her own personal shuttle. When she breached the atmosphere, the ambush had already been launched, as such the Imperial forces were on high alert, unsurprisingly. And since Vivar's shuttle had no authorization to be there, nobody knew what it was or who was on it. And Dias Ira, the Imperator Titan, had been shipped down to the planet along with the Legioni Sistati spearhead. Once the Titan noticed that an unidentified aircraft was heading straight for it, <laughs> well, you can imagine its response. On the other hand, Petronella Vivar was clearly blessed by some manner of deity, because instead of having her entire shuttle vaporized by the guns of Dia's era, it was simply crippled and forced to crash land in the middle of the swamp, where it was quickly surrounded by the living dead. Well, okay, so maybe it wasn't that lucky, but at least she was alive for the next two or three minutes before she was brutally gnawn into tiny pieces by zombies. Or at least she would have, if it was not for her bodyguard, a sworn servant by the name of Magard and his magical sword. Now, this was apparently a Kirillian blade forged in ancient terror and said to be able to sever the connection between the soul and the body. Now, this might sound like good old-fashioned mystical nonsense, but considering the fact that a mere touch of the blade was enough to render the living dead dead once again, I'm thinking it might actually have some uh, basis in reality. Again, these basic living dead, not the plague bearers, were in all due likelihood minor warp entities that had been drawn to the place and then been forced or incited into occupying the various corpses lying around. They were minor spirits, not really demons per se, but the kind of lower-ranked demonic creatures. They are creatures of pure emotions and instinct. They are not intelligent per se, but they do know enough that since they feed on emotions, and the stronger the emotion the better, if they can inhabit a corpse, scare the living shit out of people, and then tear them limb from limb, that they will be far much yummy yummy emotion to feast upon. Unfortunately for the poor warp creatures, as mentioned, the Carillion Blade was enough to kill them outright and banish the creatures back into the warp. And of course, once the spirit left the rotting corpse, the rotting corpse returned to being, well, a rotting corpse. Not much of a threat to anyone who doesn't intend to eat it or breathe it for extended periods of times. And every cloud has, as they say, a silver lining. Whilst Petronella Vivar might have preferred that her shuttle didn't go crashing into the swamp like a burning comet to the Legionis Estates, this was an actual blessing. Finally, they had a landmark, and a landmark that could be seen for miles in any direction. A fairly large shuttle on fire, burning merrily in the middle of the swamp. This allowed Horus to locate it, identify what it was by heading over there himself, arriving just in time to ensure that Magard and his mistress were not turned into snacks, by the way, and then order the rest of the Astartes forces on the planet to gather on the burning shuttle, allowing him to reorganize the Astartes into effective firing lines. 
and once the Astartes were properly organised, they could then easily defeat the clumsy, lumbering corpses. As such, the undead simply withdrew and began bidding their time, seeing if the Astartes wouldn't do something silly. Oh, and as a bit of a side note, although it will become rather important later, Magard took a rather immediate liking to Horus. Unsurprisingly, Horus is a demigod warrior, as such, someone who has been raised from birth to idealize warriorhood and fighting like Magard has, as a indentured bodyguard servant, one of the best indeed, it's unsurprising that he took a liking to Horus, and he offered his services to Horus. Now, Petronella Vivar probably just saw this as a symbolic gesture, after all, she was his mistress, and if he did anything to displease her, well, his end would probably be rather swift and unavoidable. Whether or not that is how things will end up happening, well, we'll see. I have a feeling we'll be seeing Magard again, not too far into the future. But for now, the Astartes had managed to gather up and secure their position. Additionally, now the Dies Ira could finally lend her full weight of firepower to the engagements. Previously, the Principe had been reluctant in firing upon the Walking Dead because he couldn't see Diddly Dick in the fog. Even his most advanced senses were practically blind. As such, firing weapons of Imperator Titan class into that almost certainly would have caught plenty of Astartes in the blast as well, something the Principe was not willing to risk. But with all of the Astartes handily gather around a massive burning beacon, that was no longer a problem. And so, with the full fire support backing of the DS era, the Adeptus Astartes could once again advance to the signal source, which turned out to be a massive fuck-off starship. Apparently, the Rebels had realised that any future naval engagement would almost certainly not be to their benefit, and crashed the motherfucker directly into the moon. Now, normally, of course, crashing a starship onto a planet is not a good idea. In fact, it is very unlikely that the starship is going to be surviving the experience, and indeed it is very, very likely that a lot of the starship's very own superstructure has been built precisely to exist in a vacuum, in the void, without gravity. Which of course means that once you introduce said ship to a planet's atmosphere, it is uh, unlikely to remain unscathed for very long. And that is, of course, if you actually manage to land the thing in the first place. It might surprise you to learn this, but most starships are not equipped with landing struts. Nor indeed would it help them much even if they were. On the bright side, the source of the unusually powerful signal was now made blatantly obvious. It was a capital ship's Vox system. Small wonder that they could hear it from orbit, considering that the damn thing had been designed to operate over millions of kilometers. The presence of this boat, however, also suggests a few other things. One, it is Temba's flagship, the Glory of Terror. Two, it's crash-landed on the moon, because, well, it's crash-landed on the moon. This means that anyone that was aboard the ship when it crash-landed is gotta be dead, because you don't survive that shit unless your name is Cyphus Kane. Three, that means that Erebus must have some kind of other reasons for bringing them there. After all, if all of the rebels are dead, then again, dead has a bit of a different meaning on this particular planet so far, so perhaps that is not quite as important as it might at first seem. Nevertheless, the Mournival suggested that perhaps Horus shouldn't wander into this particular mess, because, well, it was getting pretty obvious that shit was getting well and truly out of hand. They figured that perhaps they should retreat, and at the very least bombard the site from orbit before moving in. Horus disagreed, as Erebus must surely have known he would. His honour had been... Well, damaged, basically. He had given this guy command, he was now a traitor, and that was partially Horus's responsibility. As such, Horus had to be the man to kill him. And so Horus could simply not risk that a stray round from a bombardment cannon would finish the job. So he dismissed his Mournival's uh, well-meaning advice, although perhaps misplaced, and strode off back into the swamp with the words, Mark my words, Garviel Loken, everything achieved thus far in this crusade will pale into insignificance 
compared to what I am yet to do. Well, he isn't wrong. <laughs> But that was still, of course, far, far into the future. Horus decided that he would take a single company with him inside the starship and some support elements. Parts of the starship was still suspended in mid-air over the swamp, looking precarious, to put it rather mildly, but, well, it had been down here for something along the lines of 60 years, judging by the corrosion, so if it hadn't collapsed previously, Surely it wouldn't collapse now. Horus chose to take Luke Sedir's company with him into the wrecked starship, which seems like an odd choice. He had officers like Abaddon, Loken, and Tariq Torgarden with him, and yet Loken and Tariq were stationed outside the ship on perimeter patrol. Now, Luke Sedir is a competent line officer, but you can't really compare him to members of the Mournival. Then again, that very same Mournival had recently gainsayed Horus, and he was probably, perhaps even subconsciously, punishing them for that breach of etiquette, for questioning him, essentially. So, he ventured into the wrecked starship, meeting no resistance. The ship had taken a battering, unsurprisingly, considering it had fallen out of the literal fucking sky. But considering that, it was remarkably intact. Of course, as soon as the thought struck Horus, the ship immediately collapsed. And now, I'd like to point out, this was a massive ship, an interstellar vessel of gargantuan proportion, half of which was still suspended over the swamp. Now, that ship broke in two, which means that some few hundred thousand tons of starship impacted into the frothing waters below, sending out a tsunami of literal shit and vile offal in every direction, impacting rather heavily upon the Astartes that had been left outside to guard the ship. Luckily, of course, they were adept as Astartes. Regular troops would likely have died then and there, but Astartes' power armor is capable of keeping the operator alive in the cold depths of the void, and was more than able of keeping its wearers alive in a literal poo tsunami. But unfortunately, the shit tsunami was not the only problem the Astartes had to deal with. The dead clearly took this as a signal and began assaulting the Astartes lines in ever-increasing numbers. The fog lifted for but one single moment, revealing tens of thousands of the monstrosities, slowly but surely and inexorably walking towards the downed starship and its thin, light green line of defenders. Aboard the collapsed starship itself, Horus had been separated from the rest of Luke Sedir's company, and Horus, characteristically, chose to push ahead alone. Not possibly the wisest of decisions, but again, as I have said, Horus considered this to be a personal responsibility. He had to find Temba, and he had to kill Temba. And he was going to do it regardless of the cost. And also, I'd like to point out that a starship falling on you is a bit more than even a Primarch is likely to withstand. Horus had taken a rather nasty wound, with a jagged piece of metal going straight through his Primarch armor and impaling him in the abdomen. This is the kind of shit that would kill a human and probably cripple an Astartes, but Primarchs are made of sterner stuff, and he was still more or less combat effective. However, he did start to question the wisdom of leading this assault personally. Again, I'd like to point out, Horus was undoubtedly, shall we say, misguided in this errand. He was not completely aware of this himself either, but he felt that this was his responsibility. He had to deal with it, not just out of a pure sense of ego, but also because, well, Yugan Temba had been a friend of his. He had chosen him. He had believed in his character. And as such, he viewed this once again as a personal betrayal, and had to continue, despite the fact that he was looking more and more like a rather obvious trap. 
And shortly thereafter, Horus's worst suspicions were confirmed as he ran into more of the dead things and even more of the plague bearers. Seeing their flesh quite literally liquefy under his blows, he finally realized precisely what was going on here. He was fighting warp spawns. This was not some mere betrayal, some rogue regiment. This was not even just a Xeno's gallery of various horrifying beasties. This was the warp, and it had taken control of not only the ship, but the very planet itself, and it had almost certainly corrupted his previous friend, Temba. And speaking of the now rather infamous uh, rebel, Horus finally made it to the bridge and saw Temba, having recently impaled Luke Sadir on his sword. Uh, this did not help Horus's mood particularly much, as you might probably suspect, and he flew at Temba in a rage. Now, normally, a Primarch would have absolutely no problems whatsoever beating the shit out of some random follower of Nurgle. Even if we were to assume that Temba had been elevated to Demon Prince status, he'd have a pretty damn hard time taking on a Primarch. However, the Anathema had a particularly nasty little feature. The sword was designed to specifically target the individual whose name was whispered to it. So, when Eugene Temba whispered the words Horus Lupercal to the sword, it became an anathema to him. Clever name. I know. Which meant that the sword itself was fighting Horus more so than Temba, and the sword apparently was really, really fucking good, and actually managed to wound the Primarch by stabbing him in the shoulder. And not really due to a mistake on Horus's part either. Horus was a ridiculously good fighter, and one of the heaviest parts of an Adeptus Astartes armor are the shoulders. As such, Horus, in all due likelihood, expected the blow to glance off harmlessly, utilizing his armor as part of a defensive strategy. Unfortunately for him, the anathema went through mastercrafted Primark plate like it was fucking paper, and it cut deep into the Primark shoulder, where it immediately began working on disassembling the Primark on a molecular level dumping a poison inside his system so effective that it managed to counteract even a Primarch's immune system. Although, again, I'd like to point out, generally speaking, if an anathema so much it scratches you, you are dead. Like that. Snap. You're dead. You're gone. It would still take a few hours before horror started really feeling the effect. That's how tough Primarch actually are. However, he did eventually manage to defeat Temba, disarming him, sending the weapon skittering off into the darkness. And rather interestingly, and unusually, for a moment, Temba regains controls over his senses. He uncorrupts himself. Now, my hypothesis is that this was either due to a serious weakening in the war powers surrounding them, which seems unlikely, or it was done specifically because Nurgle wanted Horus to hear Temba's warning. I'm quoting from the book here, these are Temba's last words. I saw it, Warmaster. The galaxy was a wasteland, the Emperor dead, and mankind in bondage to a nightmarish hell of bureaucracy and superstition. All is grim darkness and all is war. Only you have the power to stop this future. You must be strong, Warmaster. Never forget that. Those are some rather prophetic words. Again, I am wondering whether or not this was part of the Chaos ploy or some minute chink in the armor. I have some theories as to how precisely the Emperor eventually defeated Horus, because there are a lot of interesting little tidbits throughout the books, but um, all of that is of course pure speculation as of yet, and I won't really delve into it, but all of these little hints and tidbits really are quite interesting.
What might be far more interesting, however, is of course the wound that Ahoros had taken. He managed to make his way out of the collapsed spaceship and out onto the flooded swampland, which was now receding. The dead, the moment Eugene Temba had fallen over, had ceased their animation and fallen over, flopping like dead fish in the sea. The unnatural rot had also, as I mentioned, started receding. When Horus finally made it out of the ship, he was battered but standing for a while until he collapsed face first down into the swamp. This was not normal, as you can probably expect, and his surrounding Astartes panicked the fuck out, bringing him back up to the vengeful spirit as fast as the pilot could possibly do so. When on board, the rumour had already spread across the ship that Horus had somehow been wounded. As such, the landing deck, this was undoubtedly a really retarded mistake on the behalf of whoever was in control of the landing deck, but regardless, the landing deck was now crawling with civilians, off-duty military personnel, and remembrance that heard the rumour. And so, when the Astartes arrived with their wounded Primarch, they beelined it for the Apothecarium, not giving the faintest fucking shit about the mortals in their way, killing dozens of them as they made their way through the crowd with fists and boots flying. Unlikely to make for very good propaganda, that, but they certainly did get the Primarch to the Apothecarium rather quickly. Unfortunately, there was precious little the Apothecarians could do for the Primarch. The Anathema's poison was working its way through his veins, constantly mutating and changing itself to defeat all of the Primarch's body's countermeasures. Indeed, it turned those very countermeasures against the Primarch, giving him a ridiculously high fever and breaking down his entire body on a molecular level. There was nothing the Apothecarium could do. They had precious little knowledge as it was about a Primarch's physiology, and the Emperor, well, he was a few months at least of warp travel away. No way in hell Horus survives that. The Apothecarians reckoned he might survive days at best. And I realize that Horus is about to die and everything, but this is a wonderful time to talk about something completely fucking different. Don't blame me, the pacing of the book is somewhat off in this particular section, isn't it? So, millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of miles away on Prospero, Magnus is feeling bad for himself. He has recently been censored by the Emperor at the Conclave of Nikea, which is something we will get into much, 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 much later, unfortunately. All you really need to know is that Nikea was a conclave called by the Emperor to make a ruling upon the usefulness and therefore the sanction of psychers being used by the Legiones Astartes. The Thousand Sons, unsurprisingly, were on the pro side of that particular argument, but lost. Ariman. Magnus and the entire Legion had been completely and utterly banned from using any and all of their psychic powers. Magnus was about to disobey that particular order by initiating a huge ritual to send a message to Horus. Somehow, Magnus knew that Horus was about to run into some rather nasty warp nonsense of his own and that something was about to attempt to corrupt the Warmaster. This is probably explained later on, but for the moment we are working off knowledge from the second book, so we are somewhat limited. This ritual would require the lives of a lot of supplicants, but hey, there's plenty of those around. He would send a psychic message and send himself in spirit to the Warmaster to try and make sure that he would stay on the correct path. He was doing this despite the blanket ban imposed by the Emperor, because surely, when Father sees what a good boy Magnus really is, he will realize that he was in the wrong imposing this ban upon the Thousand Sons, not only lifting the ban, but also giving Magnus a serious amount of headpats. <laughs> 
Now, of course, with the knowledge we have in modern 40k, this sounds a lot like pouring gasoline on the fire, but, well, Magnus didn't necessarily know about this. Magnus viewed the warp as nothing but a field of study, and after all, what possible harm could study do? The warp was simply a source of power. It had some pitfalls in it, undoubtedly, but it could be controlled with enough knowledge and enough guidance. In all due honesty, Magnus was just about as blind as everyone else to what the warp actually was. He understood more about the warp than any other person except perhaps for the Emperor, but he failed to realize one really important little tidbit, namely that the warp was playing with him just as much as he was playing with the warp. In other news, Horus is still dying, and he called for his remembrancer Petronella Vivar to jot down his final thoughts, as he knew himself he was probably a goner. And in these final thoughts, he said some rather incendiary things, shall we say. He talked about being made Warmaster, he talked about the stares he got from many of the other Primarchs, the feeling that they didn't appreciate him, that they would not follow him. He talked about how Angron would absolutely not even give him the time of day, as many of the Primarchs could barely bear to even congratulate him. He even compared Angron's reaction to that of Gilliman, saying that he felt that Gilliman thought it should have been him rather than Horus. He said that he felt that the only brothers of his that truly accepted his new posting as Warmaster were Lorga, Mortarion, Sanguinius, Fulgrim, and Dawn. The rest, he claimed, were very, very reluctant to accept him as Warmaster, many again thinking that the job should have been theirs. Lionel Johnson, for example, was very, very sure that, yeah, the job should have been his. Horus, on the other hand, would have considered that to be almost insane. He told Petronella Vivar, Did you know he'd grown up living like an animal in the wilds, little better than a feral savage? He said this about Lionel Johnson, which was true. Lionel Johnson spent his early years living out in the rather hostile forests of his home planet of Caliban. But still, this shows a fair bit of disconnect between the brother Primarchs. They've always been characterized as often competing, occasionally even vaguely hostile, but always in a brotherly sense. They would compete with each other, they might even dislike some of each other, but they were never outright hostile. This final account by Horace Lupercal paints a somewhat different picture. It paints a picture of a somewhat dysfunctional family of very, very, very different individuals. Many were outright hostile towards another, and many simply wished for their other's downfall in many cases. This is something that we will explore much further in other books, but for example, there was also a lot of disconnect between the brothers themselves. Dawn, for example, viewed Petarabo as a rival, but a friendly rival. On the other hand, Petarabo viewed Dawn as his nemesis, and in a very, very suspicious and outright hostile manner. Lionel Johnson was not at all fond of Horace, but he never went quite so far as to defame him and to a mortal. That would be scandalous, to put it rather bluntly. And perhaps even more scandalous than all of that was Horus's suggestion that Sanguinius should have been made Warmaster instead of him. Now, this might sound innocuous, but this essentially boils down to Horus criticizing the Emperor's decision, again, something that was virtually unheard of at this point in time. He also expresses a worry that bureaucracy and officialdom is taking over the Imperium, that the Imperium is losing its soul to these lesser men, these mortals. All of this must have sounded quite shocking to Petronella Vivar, which was writing it all down as Horace continued talking about his feelings, how he felt in part betrayed, both by the Emperor, his brothers, and indeed 
the wider Imperium. He was afraid that his glorious legacy, his work of conquering the galaxy, would all be forgotten. It would all be replaced by the bureaucrats, the administrative functionaries, and so all of his achievements and those of his legions would be relegated to a footnote in history. He mentioned that his entire legacy would be kindly remembered by those who supplanted it as the deeds of a bygone age. To put it rather simply, he was afraid of being forgotten. And he probably viewed these last words that he spoke to his personal remembrancer as kind of his parting words, his last legacy, and he wanted it, if nothing else, to re be remembered. And as such, he made it perhaps a little bit more inflammatory than he might have meant to if he was being diplomatic. But I do suspect these were his honest emotions, his honest feelings, and his honest take on things. And it certainly shines a great deal of light upon the events that were about to take place. But we will get to that in a moment. For now, Horus continued his talk with his Remembrancer. It is unclear exactly what else he said, but they were apparently in there for hours. And many of the Astartes also felt wounded by this. Abaddon expressed a sense of outrage that Horus had chosen to spend his last few hours in this world not with Abaddon or his loyal warriors, but with some mortal woman, a remembrancer, a bureaucrat from Terra, someone who had never fought and bled for the galaxy like the Lunar Wolves and now the Sons of Horus had. As far as Abaddon and I imagine a great number of Astartes were concerned, this seemed to justify the Lodge's narrative that they were being replaced. And in the midst of all of this turmoil, that very same Lodge called for a meeting. And while it seemed like a strange time to be calling a meeting, what with the Primarch on his deathbed and all, many showed up to hear what the Lodge had to say, and what they suggested was quite, um... Extreme, shall we say, and rather insane, so might even go so far as to suggest. Because the Lodge suggested taking Horus down to the plant of Davin and handing him over to a bunch of crazy fuckers in a religious temple, closing the door, and then simply sitting outside waiting for Horus to wander out of God's house. Yeah, in an age where religion was considered to be complete and utter fucking bullshit, that is a rather controversial fucking suggestion. Erebus and his cronies had convinced the Lodge Master Sdeer and several others that apparently the Davenites had some ancient kind of healing ritual magic pond or whatever kind of nonsense known as the House of the Serpent, and if they locked Horus inside of it, there was a decent chance he'd be walking back outside alive. There's also a general sense of outrage here, both over the potential death of the War Master, and also, again, over the fact that he spent his final hours with a Remembrancer. At the end, he was placed within a stasis field to keep him alive for long enough to transport him down to Davin. Now, even if they had put him in a stasis field and brought him to the Emperor, one, there's no guarantee that even the stasis field would have kept him alive for long enough, and two, there was no guarantee that the Emperor could save him either. Granted, there's fuck all guarantee that some bunch of religious fanatics down on some backwater barbarian planet can too, but at least they can bring him there in time. The Lodgemaster called a vote and said that they would only go ahead if they had everyone's backing. And everyone decided to go with it, despite some rather obvious naysaying, but this was the life of their Primarch. They had to try anything. And at this point in time, Erebus was still considered to be a believable individual, and the one person, or well, two actually, that probably would have stood against this, Loken and Torek Torgarden, were not there. 
They were down on the planet below trying to find the weapon that had wounded the War Master, hoping that if they could find the weapon, then the Apothecaries would be able to reverse engineer whatever poison was found on it and come up with a solution to save the War Master. Good thinking, ultimately pretty fucking pointless in this case, but they did discover the weapon and bring it back. It swiftly became obvious that this was a Kinnenbracht weapon, however. And, since there wasn't a whole lot of those fuckers lying around the galaxy, it could only have come from one place, namely the Hall of Devices, upon the Intrax planet that they had visited before starting the war. This was rather suspicious, to put it. Fairly bluntly, Erebus had said that an anathema had been stolen, despite no one actually knowing what weapon had been stolen, and voila, there we have a Kinnenbracht weapon on Davin's moon, in the hands of Temba. Huh. Granted, this was not really enough evidence to simply pop back into orbit and place a cap in Erebus's ass. However, it was enough to perhaps stir up a little bit of shit, but unfortunately for Loken, he was just a tiny bit too late. He was told, while flying back up to the Vengeful Spirit, that Horus's body had been taken down to Davin to be entombed inside the temple. Loken immediately diverted and headed down to Davin to try and stop it, but he was too late. The War Master was sealed inside of the temple, and his fate was up to whatever gods were willing to listen. And that, just as the War Master is entombed, is where I will leave you for now, with a little bit of a cock tease. I'm sorry that I have to split these episodes up, but there is a lot to talk about in these books, and they're rather long. I'd rather have a couple hour long videos instead of doing two or three hours things, so I will be splitting them up a little bit when they get, well, to this length, essentially. Honestly, I should have stopped like 10 minutes ago, but I wanted to get to a natural stopping point. And since there is a lot to talk about with what happened to Horus while he was inside the temple, this seemed fairly natural. And so I have, as always, been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.